Welcome to Whitetail Wednesdays. I'm James. And I'm Jared. And we are going to be hosting this. We're from Boga Hunting, and we're going to be talking about hunting out of state. And we're going to go through a few of the things that we do when we look to um, going to a new state and then especially hunting on public land. So let's get started. So the first thing to do when you are hunting out of state is, is obviously to pick a state. So we do a few things to make that happen, um, and it, it really starts with setting goals. So talk about some of the goals that we've set in the past. Yeah, so obviously with like anything else, setting goals helps you set the pre- precedence on whatever you're going to be doing. Um, so one of the goals that uh, we looked over, uh, do we want to see a lot of deer? Do we want to see big bucks? Um, or do you want to go and see scenery? So really those are kind of the, the first little three goals that we like to kind of go over. And then, and then, um, we like to hit on all of them. Yeah. I like to, I like to have a little bit of everything. Yeah. So, yeah. and that kind of sets, like I said, it sets the precedence of the trip. Um, because then you start thinking about, okay, now that we have our goals in place, what's the next thing? So we start looking at setting a budget and what the budget is going to encompass are things like tags, um, gas, gas. Are you staying anywhere that requires a fee like a uh, campsite lodge, or are you going to be roughing it out, uh, food, and you really going to want to s- set the budget and then try to complete the hunt in that time or yeah, try to stick in that budget. The budget. Yeah. Yeah. And one big thing for when it comes to tags is, uh, when you hunt out of state, there are some states that offer um, discounts for different things. So yeah. um, if you're a military veteran, um, a lot of states will have different discounts based on uh, on that and, and disability status. Um, and also, if you're the first time, it's the first time that you've ever hunted in the state. So Wisconsin, for example, uh, first time you go there, uh, you get a, a, a cheaper tag than Half the second off, time. Half off, we found out. Which was really great. It, it helps people, uh, you know, go to new new areas, and, and it's it works well for, especially when it's your first time in the state. Um, something else to consider when looking at states is, is CWD. Um, mm-hmm. That's always been a thing, or at least, at least it has been in, in for, for a long time. Um, and so check what states are getting hit hard. Uh, that could impact the decision you make, whether you hunt there or not. Yeah, and then... Once you kind of narrow that down, you narrow it down even further. And it's actually looking at the, the terrain of the state. Are you looking at doing a spot and stock hunt? Are you going to go public land, DIY, hang and hunt? Uh, you really got to look at, you got to look at the terrain and you got to pinpoint what you want to do with it. Yeah. So when you're, when you pick a state, you go down to a region. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what you can also then from region, I, I try to go to counties, uh, and in the past, what we'll look at are statistics that each county puts out based on um, harvest numbers, uh, buck to doe ratio, uh, success rates for hunters. Um, sometimes different counties will have special reports in the deer population. Uh, maybe they're doing a study or they're trying something new like APR zones. You um, act, you've actually called local biologists, though, too, Yeah. and found out you know what's going on with the local deer herd or finding out about Movement the lo- and, yeah, yeah. local area. Um, Water levels, yeah, with rivers. One. If there's a place you're going to with with water, how are those looking? Yeah, they can give a lot of good intel. Well, and sometimes when you're looking at states, you can talk to these guys, and, and often we'll, we'll do a lot of public land hunting. So we'll call a, a biologist and say, you know, what does the availability of public land look like there? We'll try to pinpoint, um, you know, areas that have giant swaths of public land a lot of times, but sometimes we'll look at small parcels. Um, so places that like the average guy might overlook, um, things that you can use, uh, one of the mapping apps like HuntWise mm-hmm. to identify these little things that just like little checker marks in the map. And a lot, a lot of times people overlook them cause they're small. Maybe they're 10, 20 acres that, you know, people aren't paying attention to. Um, and then I've got a, a little secret tip <laughs> that we've used so in the past. secret anymore. Everybody's going to know that watches this. But one thing I do is once I've picked a state, a region, a county, and then maybe a spot in a county, I will look for hunting leases around it. Maybe I'll or, – or even find, like, Facebook groups for certain counties in certain areas. And you can actually – utilize their trail cameras because often mm-hmm. on the leasing the hunting lease they'll throw up trail cameras to show and kind of sell their property as this great hunting location and even if it's a couple miles away it'll give you a great sense as to um you know what kind of bucks are in the area and I, we've done it in the past we did it in wisconsin last year where yeah. it's like we have a good idea of um of where maybe there might be big bucks might be so mm-hmm. other thing um last kind of on that topic was uh, uh blogs 
a lot of times I'll get information on blogs. Um, that's it can be hit or miss because sometimes people lie. Uh, <laughs> because I mean, you don't want to give away your great spot. But, I've got a good spot for you. Yeah, and sometimes they give general information, and sometimes maybe they outright lie. Uh, but I always keep my eye on it. You never know. Um, even if a lot of people are talking about it, sometimes I'll be like, well. Maybe that's too good. Maybe there's too many people there. Too many people are mm-hmm. going to read this, and it's going to be blown out. So look there. You can draw whatever conclusions you want, but that that's another one. So, yeah, now that you've got your goal set in place, a budget down, you've picked a state, you've picked a region, now you're going to start looking for spots. And this is where – this is your bread and butter because no matter how many spots you have – they're always sometimes going to look different once you get your boots on the ground. So it's great to grab a map and really start marking them out. So on our, our HuntWise accounts, um, we were able to share points whenever we see them. And we're, we're starting this months in advance. Yeah, we're just If we've got downtime, we hop on HuntWise and find like two or three spots that we like. We're looking for bedding areas. We're looking for swamps. Uh, we're looking for food. And then, of course, those transitional pieces in between. Um, so those three things, food, water, and bedding should be your three primary targets when you're looking for spots. And just look for travel points in between. We look for, I mean, pinch points really at the end of the day, what funnels deer activity into one spot. It's, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it and to think about it, but I mean, the, the principle is pretty simple. Find these, these pinch points. And if you can, on top of that, um, try to find a pinch point that's hard for people to get to, um, that's just bonus because then you can count on them you know right and even in. and even use different mapping features yeah um because if you use one map and look at the satellite imagery i know i've looked at google maps too and you can zoom in pretty far and i've been able to see deer trails yeah. or multiple deer trails uh, and so then i go back onto the the mapping software and, and mark a plot right there um well and some maps are taken in different seasons so sometimes right. it's like a deep summer Everything's green, really hard to see what's going on. Um, sometimes you get fall and, and late fall, winter, and, and you can see into the trees and see what's going mm-hmm. on in there. So definitely worth looking at different maps. Um, obviously, like like Jared said, you, you get there often, and um, the terrain looks totally different than what you thought it would look like uh, looking yeah. at a map. So obviously, if you can, scout ahead of time. Take a weekend trip. Take the kids. Camp yeah. out there. Um, we'll, we'll do that sometimes if we can, um, obviously, you know, obviously work schedules and, and family life and everything else gets crazy. But if you have maybe even a day or two, um, bomb out there, just take a look around. It'll pay off big. Yeah. Um, or you if you, there. or if you even know somebody out there, have them go and check out the property yep. and just do a little scouting for you. You got to find like a local college kid, give yeah. them like 50 bucks, Venmo, some beer money. Beautiful. Yep. Um, okay. So say you get those things down, you pick your area, you pick your spots, you got it all mapped out. The next thing you got to do is really prepare for the trip. Um, Mm -hmm. and that starts with the gear that you're going to need. Um, first things first, when we're looking to go out of state, we're looking at what type of camping experience, because often we're, we're camping or going to be in a car climate. Yep. Climate. And climate. So it's like, do we need uh, a tent like a, with a, with a close bottom, maybe it's buggy, or do we need more of a teepee style mm-hmm. with a stove? It's going to be cold. Are we car camping? Are we backpacking in on occasion? We've, we've done hotels. Um, we just are, are thriftier than a hotel often yeah. and we like to sleep outside. Um, so that's big. So consider that. And, and when you make that consideration, then you kind of decide on food because that is dependent on, you know, are you, hiking everything in yeah. where you need to dehydrate all your food which you can buy it pre-made um we'll often make our own like you can dehydrate chili and meat and fruit I mean, fruit and anything fruit's a good source out yeah. there yeah it you can you can do it pretty cheap that way and it works pretty well um yeah so we'll make our own if we're doing that um but if you're camping out of your car then you can grab a couple of huge coolers i'll use a lot of dry ice and what i'll do is i'll take my big cooler throw my frozen food in there keep dry ice on it and I'll take food out for maybe two days at a time, and I'll put it in a bag cooler. Hmm. Um, and that'll be like a fridge-freezer situation. I just got back from 16 days in Yellowstone. We, I never went inside, and I kind of stuck to that system. Um, and so my wife, my daughter, and I ate well. The How long did time. that ice stay in there? I had to make just a couple curious. trips to Walmart to fill it in. Um, okay. It just depends how full it is. The fuller it is with frozen stuff, the longer it'll keep. The more empty airspace you get, the more you run through it. Um, 
But, you know, we that's how I like to eat. I mean, there are tons of guys out there who are McDonald's guys. Um, <laughs> I would advise against it because it plays – food, I think, plays a huge part in how you hunt, especially when you're out of state. You don't have the luxury to go home and, you know, use your own bathroom, mm-hmm. lay in your own bed. Um, so I try to eat food that makes you feel good. So McDonald's, you know, if you feel like crap, you're gassy the whole time. You're not always going to be the you're greatest out of state You're going to have hunter. a bad time. You're going to have a bad time. You're going to, you know, you're going to get winded. You don't want that. Um <laughs> So I that's 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 at least my my approach sure. to that. Water. You, oh yeah. Uh, we have different approaches on water. Yeah. So I am a water filter fan. Yeah. But you you are a. Well, I'll use a water filter if I'm camping. If I'm like if I need it. But if I'm out of the car, I'm just bringing a bunch of gallons of water. Oh, of course. But I recently in the past, you and I have gone. We had a car nearby. And I filled up my, my water filter and just yeah. drank from the stream. So, I mean, it works. It worked just fine. It was actually pretty cool. Hey, if I'm in the land, yeah. I'm in the land. You're like becoming one. I've become the land. And you you didn't get beaver fever or anything. Not a one. That was for high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, it, but I mean, that's the two, the, the difference. I mean, if you're camping back, look into, um, what do you use? I use the Sawyer. The it's Sawyer. It's just a squeeze bag. I've got a bunch of different sizes. You've fill it up in the creek or the pond or yep. whatever it is, and you just kind of compress yep. it, and it just goes in your water bottle. And that takes the floaties out. I've used the uh, the SteriPen, which yeah. works, but it's like, man, I'm trusting a lot to this light, and there still are floaties. That Whatever that is, it's, it's still going it's in. still looking at me. Yeah. I don't want it. So you, well, one tip, actually, that I, I've learned from that is I take my um, my buff in the past. Oh, you pour it? And I pour it through, and I at least try to filter it once through there. You're not worried about sweat? Ah. Uh, yeah. At that point, Mine though, was? everything's yeah, sterile. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, okay. who cares? They're, they're cleaning it out. So um, just a, just one tip. Um, That's fine. Then you kind of go into gear. Um, and that obviously plays – the, the type of gear you bring depends on the type of hunt. Are you early season, I mean, Kentucky, or are you late season, like Saskatchewan, you're out there and it's it's cold? Mm-hmm. Now, although not Saskatchewan this year, from the, you're from the U.S., you're not allowed in. Um, yeah. So when it comes to f- clothing and uh, when you're hunting out of state, we try to keep things as minimal as possible. And so we stick to a pretty simple um, layering system for our clothing. Um, and so this this is the same basic system that we use, whether it's an early season hunt, you know, um, late September uh, or late December, early January. Um, and so it starts with um, it starts with merino. So everything that's touching our our body is merino uh, wool. Um, so merino undies, if you can, long johns, I have a merino shirt touch on my skin and the thickness of the merino will depend really on how cold it is outside. So I'll go real thin in the, the summer with maybe just like a leafy camo over top. And at the end of the year, I got this thick boy on mm-hmm. there. Um, so next I'll always throw a, um, kind of a wind blocking layer, like a grid fleece. Uh, we use these all the time. Like, I feel like this is one of the, the pieces of clothing I wear most. Um, it, you can move in it, it airs out well, and it actually blocks a little of the wind. So I like right. that. Um, puffy. So puffy can look, uh, your insulation layer can look very different depending on whatever you're doing. So if, if it's early season, this is a, a one that packs down real small. You can use it for the morning and the evening. When it gets later, we'll stick to like, we'll get some bibs and like a full yeah. coat. Um, and then I also always bring, cause you don't want it, your, your hunt out of state to be, cut short but i always bring like a rain gear a rain layer um so that you can sit out in the rain hopefully right when the rain goes away that buck comes out and you're ready for him so um it's good stuff man i might take some of that yeah it's uh yeah it's pretty good stuff i don't know that it fit you though yeah, it's probably not all right next up is uh backpacks uh we believe pretty firmly that you need a good backpack and so vanna you want to pull out some of this stuff as i talk about it Typically, when we go hunting um, out of state, we will be going either like hiking in pretty far, trying to use waders or something to go where people don't go, or maybe a kayak. So that means to go in, we're carrying a lot of gear in. We're carrying a tree saddle or, or maybe our, our waders, our, a bunch of stuff, maybe a camera. Um, and then hopefully we're carrying out a deer. And so right. the idea is you carry something like a small day pack that goes on a frame that at least this is what's worked for us Mm -hmm. that will cinch down when you're not using it. And that will expand, uh, maybe when you're loaded up with stuff or maybe it's later in the season. Yeah. Um, So actually this particular backpack, um, when it breaks away from the frame can actually carry out, uh, at least 200 pounds. Yeah. A whole, a whole Jared, a whole me. So if he goes down, I strap him on the back and I I hear (laughs) him out of there. But I guess the, the taller you are and the more frame you can extend the, the more weight you can carry. But just to have that 
that added uh, feature of being able to carry out more than what you bring in. Yeah. You're not going to be bringing in 200 pounds of gear. If you are, you're overpacking. Right, yeah. Um, Get but, bricks in there. But you have the ability to pack something out. Big old stinky buck. Right. So. Um, a few things in this pack that we deem essential. Um, so first, binos. Um, we've always got them on us. Uh, hip, uh, on our chest, on our back pocket. Um We'll be scanning the entire time we're sitting out. We'll glass in the mornings. We'll glass right when we get there to see where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, we're just glassing a lot. It saves leg time, and it just you, you see a ton more things that you would, didn't even know were there. Yeah. You just take out your glass. Mm -hmm. Next is a kill kit. Thank you. Um, in the kill kit, I just bring a couple essentials. Uh, so, like, say we're archery hunting, we'll always bring them out multi-tool. I've dropped Talent tool. These yeah, Alan. Hands. Yeah, Alan wrench. Uh, and so, you know, I've dropped my bow out of my tree stand before and had one of those available. You cinch it back up, you're good to go. Um, you got your knife, uh, which make sure you get something either replaceable blade or something that doesn't need to be sharpened a ton or bring maybe a little whetstone or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'll bring the essentials, a little toilet paper. Um, I got some deodorant wipes in there in case you really need something going on. And uh, a little fi fire starter at the bottom. Um, one of those little sticks oh, works nice. pretty well for me. I always bring a pen because um, I kind of keep notes when I hunt. Never know when you need a pen. Never know when you need a pen. Um, the also the other thing that goes with my kill kit are game bags. Um, yeah. I, you don't always need them for deer hunting, um, but it helps kind of organize pieces of meat. It uh, keeps the flies off if it's hot out. Um, and it just protects things. And so we'll use that a lot. And if we have to hang it, we'll hang it in a tree and stuff. And, and last but not least, paracord. Yes. Um, so many things you can important. do with a paracord. Yep. Um, hang things, you know, Jared creates all these extravagant knots with his, he's doing it right now. Uh, and, uh, so extravagant. Yeah. <laughs> just pulled it through. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that can be used for anything. I use, usually get orange so I can see it in case I, I actually. Lose it. To go off of that, I did make a gear holder, a public land approved. Because you can't gear screw holder. into a tree a lot of the times with you know for holding your bow. And so, what'd you do? Uh yeah, I just take a long piece of 550 and then tied some prusink knots all along it, and it makes a fantastic lightweight all around the tree gear holder. Hang. So there's little loops all around the tree you can hang your stuff on there, and it it packs up smaller than this one. Yeah. So. Yep. Saving, yeah, well. saving weight definitely as much as you can, and that's that's just one little way. There's, yep. I mean, there's guys that cut off half of their toothbrush to save weight. I saw that, yeah. But we we're generally not, not doing us. that. It's not a goat hunt or anything for yeah. whitetail, so Nothing we're crazy. not that crazy. Uh, I use some uh, rubber coated wire uh, for like twisting stuff down or, or whatever. Um, I've used that in the past. A couple other things is an extra. I bring two flashlights. Oh. Because sometimes I'll burn through. You're not um, just like an extra battery guy? No, two flashlights if one breaks or something. Mm -hmm. um, and just adding on to flashlights, in the past I've had trouble with my battery life not lasting at all. Uh, especially I got what these are, Black Diamond. Um, and I feel like they run real quick. So what I've switched to are those um, uh, lithium batteries. And I have I leave this on, I'll read usually in the tent at mm -hmm. night. Um, and this this lasts a long time. So definitely highly recommend lithium batteries. Um and then for, lastly, uh, when we're talking about extra <laughs> things, an extra, for me, I'm a, a shoot a recurve, so I need an extra tab because I have scattered these things so throughout the woods times. between here and Colorado. Uh, just I, They fall out of my pocket. I set them down, or I sometimes just leave them on my finger, and I fling them off, and I forget. So I try to always have an extra. Um, do you bring an extra release with you? I do, actually. Yeah, yeah I do. I have my, um, my thumb release, and then I have an index release that I keep. Just buried case. deep down in my pack, just in case. You don't want to have to use that. Losing a thumb is a, a bummer. Yeah, actually, yeah. Well, that's a different topic. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, it, it's you know a, a lot a lot of these things, and you can throw in things. So if it's cold, we'll bring hand warmer. I'll bring a bunch of hand warmers when I'm out. Um. Just load them in there. We, we were in Wisconsin last year. It got pretty cold a couple of the days. And yeah. There's like, I actually saw somebody was using um those. They're not icy hot. There are these patches, like to for muscle. Uh, okay. They're bigger, warmer ones, and they'll last for a few hours. And, and he was using them for deer hunting. Ah, which a I bad idea. Try. Put them in your certain spots: your arms, your kind of groin area, your back. Your I put them on my neck, and my hands, my the hot kind spots. Of my feet, all, all the spots that'll warm you up. Um, speaking of feet, boots are oh. the next thing. Can't ever have you, not good boots. Yeah, <laughs> you, you, yeah, you gotta have it. You're gonna have a bad time. Um, so. 
we end up in mo- using muddy places whenever we yeah. hunt. It's always swampy. Uh, I mean, we're from Michigan, so we, we do a lot of swampy hunting. Uh, and so there are two sk- schools of thought when it comes to this. Um, some people like the uh, the knee-high boots, you know, your neoprene, muck-type boots. Which are great if you don't have to travel long distances. Yeah, they can hurt your feet after yeah, a while. If, you're, if you plan on walking more than three miles, I guess, a day. Yeah. The, They'll I really would, wear on you. Yeah, I would get some decent... Mm, hiking boots yeah i was gonna say mountainous traveling boots yeah but just like a a good something better i i got i think i use salewas what do you what do you have? uh the solomon 40s yeah and yeah. well what we'll do is we'll take gaiters so i don't know that i have any here but rather than um always have your neoprenes up you can have ga- throw gaiters on if you're yeah. crossing streams and sometimes i'll leave them on if i'm going across a bunch of or a bunch of streams or maybe i will we'll a lot of times try to take creek beds into mm-hmm. a spot just to keep scent down um, and you can really stay pretty dry with those. So then when you get back to your tent, the bottom of your pants not all wet, and it's yeah, just I mean, not making your life. You can kind of just make that decision as soon as you, as soon as you start looking at like the terrain that you're going to be in. If it's mar- marshy and yeah, a bunch of streams and rivers, you might want to just throw your knee highs in just in case. But if it's yeah. open plains and fields like that where it's more dry, just just bring a good set of hiking boots and make sure you're breaking them in yeah ahead of beforehand. Time. Yeah, otherwise you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, one other thing that I've done in the past, uh, when it's hot and I'm hunting in a dry spot, I'll use like tennis shoes. Yeah. Like, and there's, you know, d- d- and if if you're a big scent guy, um, you, you'd have to descent them, obviously. But um, I use them and like I stay cool. Like you can use Nike Freeze. You're really quiet when you walk in them. Um, so look into that too. Uh, there's a lot of different schools of thought on that. Um, and then finally maps. So um. When we, we'll try to bring some mapping software with us on an app, and, and sometimes we'll maybe bring like a, a topographical map that's printed out. But what we have found to be a really helpful feature is um, these apps will have the ability to download areas so mm-hmm. that you don't need to turn your service on to look at them. Because cache them. Cache them. Cache exactly. Em. And so uh, that way we can, like, it, your phone still tracks you via GPS, but you're not trying to reload every time. And uh, that saves you tons of mm-hmm. battery space. And often, like like I said, I, I don't know, my Sprint, I never have service. So I, uh, I'm i relying on that pretty heavily <laughs> when I go out. I would say, though, to kind of counterdict what you're saying. You're counterdicting me? Counterdicting yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I make up words sometimes. <laughs> um, is to learn how to read a map without having to look at your phone. You're just yeah. eliminating one more thing that you have to rely on. But if you can actually learn... The terrain features, obviously, if it's not too extravagant. Yeah. Um, but if you can learn where the main ridges are, where the rivers are, and where camp is, and you can navigate a little bit too, it kind of helps out. And yeah. you're not worried about phone battery or you're constantly looking down doing this and not figuring out where you're staring at. And yeah. It just might help out a little bit more. It is nice. And then it's just a good skill to have. It's also nice to just not be looking at your phone yeah. all the time. It's, it's nice, nice to, to have a break from that. Disconnect a little. Um, okay. So gear set. The next is like prepping yourself for the hunt. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously a couple of obvious things. If you're walk, if you're going to do a hunt that's highly physically demanding, maybe, you know, take a lap, take a few laps before Mm -hmm. you you go out hunting, uh, make sure you're in shape. Even if you're sitting down, it just makes things easier. Uh, not necessarily, doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Uh, but we found it, it pays off well, especially when you're hauling one of Jared's famous big bucks out of the woods and you got to be in good shape to do it because they're heavy horned heavy body yeah, deer. right uh the other thing is um and probably more important and this is just general i mean this would apply if you're hunting in state or out of state but practice your bow the way that you would shoot your bow in yeah the um no angles. more perfect broadside 20 yard shots right. give yourself something crazy like uh mark and i were just hey mark uh mark and i were just up at total archery challenge up in boyne mountain michigan and there's some awesome shot scenarios that they had i mean it's shooting uphill through a tree or you're shooting downhill um right next to a stump you know give yourself those those last minute shots where it's like okay this is the last opening i've got or else he's gone yeah well and there's pressure on too is all that peer pressure you don't want to blow it in front of all the dudes you know you'll feel like an idiot (laughs) mark (laughs) yeah (laughs) um so angles shooting down and shooting up um uh, often for whitetail, you're you're in a tree stand, you're shooting down, um, but you never know. You know yeah. when you're shooting uphill, mm-hmm. um, 
And like you said, I mean, deer don't come in on 20, 30, or 40 uh, yard tracks. They're usually odd numbers, and they're usually kind of maybe angling, slightly angling some way. Figure out what you're comfortable with. Um, it's it's different for everybody. Yeah. Don't feel like you need to be shooting out to 60 yards or 80 yards because that's what you see people doing online. Um, I shoot about 25 yards with the old recurve, and mm -hmm. that's about my comfort zone. Maybe yeah. a little farther, maybe maybe a little closer, depending on the situation. Um, and so, you know, obviously take that into account when you set your stand up, um, but also, you know, practice for it. Yeah. And then kind of to go off everything, um, try to go out and do a dry run. Yeah. You know, if you can pack everything up that you plan on taking and maybe just head out to some local public land, uh, even for a night with the guys you plan on going with, yeah, do it. Because you may find something when you're out that you're missing or you'd like to change this or, oh, I could really use that. And, yeah. that, and that's the time to start making those changes. It's not when you're out in the field because um, you might be an hour and a half, two hours away from the next yeah outdoor store where you need xyz you know make sure you've got everything good to go um before you're stepping off well yeah and actually to add to that dry run um take your tree stand out yeah grab one of your kids climb up a tree stand and have them retrieve your arrows for mm -hmm. you you know shoot down practice shooting if you're if you're in a, a saddle you know at your different angles and how you got to flip around if you're shooting on your bad side um or if you're sitting in a tree stand you know practice what the angle looks like. Can you draw your bow? Is your limb clearing? You know, especially with longer limb bows, you know, right. that's, that's gotten me uh, a few times when I, when I first started out, I, I would clunk my, my limbs mm -hmm. on stuff, just not used to switching from, you know, a shorter compound to a long one. Um, so get out in your tree stand. And again, that, like you said, it, it just, you work out the kinks, you'll know when you take your tree stand out or do you need to tape something? Does it react different, yeah. different temperatures or, you know, is it wet out and what does that do to it? Um, so know your gear. So by the time you get out of state, you've invested all this time in, you don't have to worry about those stupid little things and you can just focus on it's enjoying the woods. It's clean. You're punching in, hunting, yep. getting back out, clean yeah. and effective. Well, and cause when, when you're, when you're hunting out of state, there and say you do it for a week it, it get you get to a point where the routine the routine getting uh, for you to get in and out of your tree stand is is just cumbersome mm -hmm. because it's like you get all the way up you put all your stuff in you take it all down with you a lot of states you have to do that um and so it's just put up take down put up take down so the easier the time you have doing that and the more practiced you are the less you're going to just get annoyed by it and probably the, at the end of the day you'll hunt better um, but also on the same time the more you're doing it you the do quicker you are. Like yep. at the beginning of the week, you could be, you know, fumbling around with your sticks or oh, yeah. your tree stand. But by the end, it's going to be like, pop, pop, pop. Yeah. You're right up in the tree. You got like, your little coffee set, you know, where oh. it goes in your side little pocket. Bring a coffee pocket in your backpack, by the way. I like to have a little spot. I, I literally set my coffee in. I'll sip it as I go. On the the way up? No, when I'm sitting out there. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll Don't be an up. animal. No. Well, you get thirsty on the way up. You need to drink. Um, finally... Last but uh, not least, something that is just <clears throat> probably one of the more important things is, is uh, to know your regulations for where you go. Um, states, DNRs in different states are notorious for having difficult to read regulations, mm -hmm. and, and they're not all in the same format. And it, it can be difficult. Um, what we would recommend is taking the time to read through it. Take a lot of time, even if you have to outline it or take notes. Uh, definitely worth do it doing that uh, but also i'll follow it up by calling the local dnr yeah um, running any questions anything that i'm concerned about or maybe have questions about um just so you know at the end of the day i mean are there cwd requirements where you have to take out the entire deer spine and all yeah we we had that we had to do that yeah or, or can you leave you know can you debone the meat if you're really far out um can you have fires can you have you know um what, what's is there an apr zone yep. what, what's the antler point yep. restriction for that um, and then even times to hunt, uh, because you don't want to be that guy taking a that first crack way too early, <laughs> and everybody's dang looking it. at you like, dang, you know, you don't you don't want to get in trouble, you don't want to mess. Make your trip relaxing, um, so you can follow the rules, so that you're not like looking at that buck knowing that you weren't following the rules, and that'll always taint that buck mm -hmm. on your wall. You'll look at it differently; it, it'll just make it bad, and plus it's against the law. So, um, yeah, that too. Um, so those are our, that's kind of the process we go through when we're looking to hunt out of state. Um, obviously there's a lot of different things you can go into when you mm -hmm. look at maps or shooting prep or gear and gear can practices. Be three of these. And, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so if you have any questions, we're going to have a Q&A session later on. Um, feel free to start piling them up and asking them. Uh, we're, we're happy to help in any way we can. So, um, Jared, uh, do you want to send us off? Sure. Uh, if you guys want to keep in touch with us, um, this is Boga Hunting Podcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook. We've got a website with a blog. A lot of the stuff we talk about, we'll, we have topics on throughout the month. So if you guys want to stay up to date, check us out.